Thank you again, everyone, for attending our first Meaningful Inquiry uh, Showcase event, where we take some time to highlight some of the work that our previous participants have done in their teaching practice as a result of participating in the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop. My name is Amanda Folk. I am the head of the Teaching and Learning Department in University Libraries. And I know a lot of folks are familiar with Meaningful Inquiry, but there may be folks joining us who have not yet participated in the workshop. Uh, I am joined by an all-star facilitation team, um, all of whom are joining us today. Uh, but the facilitation team includes uh, Katie Bloxage, Bloxage, excuse me, who is the director of the library at our Newark campus and Central Ohio Technical College. Hannah Primo, who is an instructional designer in university libraries. Chris Mannion, who is the coordinator for writing across the curriculum in the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing. And Jane Hammonds, who is our teaching and learning engagement librarian here at university libraries. I thought folks might be curious about the reach of Meaningful Inquiry, since again, many of you have participated. We've been able to offer the workshop nine times now. Uh, the first workshop offering was in August 2019, and we do have some colleagues joining us from that group. Um, we've been able to offer the workshop three times in person and give six virtual offerings, primarily during the pandemic since that initial workshop. And we just wrapped up our third in-person workshop this morning. So we have a brand new cohort of Meaningful Inquiry alumni, some of whom are also on the call today. That brings us uh, to a total of 81 participants, folks who have completed the workshop over the past three years. And our participants uh, represent more than 20 departments across the university, including three different campuses. We've also been able to award 10 meaningful inquiry grants, which have been incentives for our uh, participants to take what they've learned in the meaningful inquiry workshop and then apply it to their courses or their assignments. Uh, the Meaningful Inquiry Grant Program, as it has existed, will be sunsetting, but later in this presentation, I'm going to be sharing um, with you information about how we're going to be offering that grant in the future in collaboration with the Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning. All right, so we've been listening since the beginning and including just this morning, uh, we've heard from our participants that they would really like more opportunities to continue to engage with meaningful inquiry after the initial workshop, and they'd really like to learn about how other participate, how other participants have integrated this workshop into their teaching. So that's why we've put together today's program. Now that we have a significant community around Ohio State. Um, we thought it would be nice to bring the community together to learn more about meaningful inquiry work that is happening in participants classrooms. We hope that today is just the first of several get togethers and that you'll consider sharing your own experiences um, with drawing upon meaningful inquiry in your teaching with colleagues in the future. So don't be surprised for those of you that are on the mailing list if you get an email from us in the future asking for volunteers to showcase the great work that you've been doing. All right, our agenda for today, we have three case studies from previous Meaningful Inquiry participants. Um, they're going to present, unless folks have a preference, please presenters let me know if you uh, would like us to switch up this order. Otherwise, I arranged folks alphabetically by last name. Uh, so we have Derek Wachkowski from the Ohio State Newark campus, Nicholas Denton from the College of Pharmacy, and Deborah Kuzawa from Engineering Education. Each of them will have some time to present and we'll have some Q&A for um, each presenter after they're done presenting. And then at the end of today's presentation, I'll give a, an update about our partnership with the Drake Institute, including different ways that Meaningful Inquiry alumni can um, receive recognition for their work and the potential for compensation for work that you might do in your courses as a result of having participated in the workshop. So with that, uh, Derek, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Um, if you'd like to share your screen, let me know and I'll stop sharing what I have here. I would like to share my screen, please. Okay. 
which means now I have to do it. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Okay, um, hello everybody. Thanks for having me out in this afternoon. Um, I <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop meant to me. Um, it was actually, it, it came along at a time that I think was uh, very um, opportune uh, because uh, I had been contemplating about uh, assignment of prompts as a academic reading and writing practice uh, for some time. The uh, <clears throat> I had uh, attended some conference sessions about uh, working with students and investigating how students read professor feedback and uh, on the papers that they assign. And I thought, well, that is an important aspect of uh, a pertinent, important literacy practice on um, you know, college and university campuses that students might not have a lot of, um, th that we expect students to kind of get, uh, um, get quick quickly caught up on on their own merits without much discussion about and so that you know some of the 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 thrust of these uh assignment or uh, conference pr uh, presentations were how can we talk to students and, and get them better um, prepared to understand instructor feedback and it got me thinking about other types of reading and writing on college campuses that we have that same sort of feeling uh same sort of kind of well here it is figure this out um attitude, um, mainly because we, who has the time perhaps, but um, syllabi and assignment prompts too, I think are a couple of those. And that when this uh, came along, I was already incorporating into my own teaching practice, making sure to uh, take a, a time out with students to kind of look at assignment prompts from across the curriculum and ask them to to put how they pull out information and what, what to think about when they're doing the prompts. And then the meaningful inquiry workshops came along, and I thought, oh, this would be uh, great to kind of spur me and keep me thinking about these sort of things. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned some of these uh, higher ed uh, reading and writing practices, teacher feedback, syllabi, assignment prompts, which is what we're talking about, and peer reviewed articles, I think is another one that how, how teaching students how to read a peer review article is probably something we don't spend enough time doing in our, uh, in our classes and in as institutions and library databases as well um so the, i think there's there's a rich field here of study to to investigate what it is that students do when they actually try to do these things and that's my interest and that's what i'm going to talk about today is how i'm shaping up a study right now to kind of investigate specifically assignment prompts and how students read assignment prompts um, i noticed in a lot of my um both in my classroom and in the writer studio, uh, where which the writing center here on uh, Newark campus, that there are a lot of um, students who, uh, when they come in with a prompt, they get really drawn to the numbers game. Um, and I want to thank Katie Bloxage for the d design of this slide for something that we did earlier this summer. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, they really are concerned with the, some of the things that leap out to them right away when they're reading a prompt, the number of pages or uh, how many points an assignment's worth or hey, the Derek, number of sources. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but we got no slides up. Oh, okay. <laughs> maybe I didn't. Oh, did I? Hmm. What are you, you seeing? You and all of the rest of us. Oh, why is it not? It, it hit PowerPoint. Oh, boy. OK, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, wait a second. There's nothing here. Katie designed <laughs> nothing. I see you're giving yeah. her no credit. Yeah. So, you know, well, I gave her credit, but there's nothing, nothing to give her credit <laughs> for, apparently. All right. Let me see. Where's now? I don't know where the share screen thing is. The giant green button on the bottom. No, there well, so that's the problem. There is no giant green button on the bottom. Oh no. <laughs> I have let me see if I can move this over to do you see it now? No, it's not sharing oh. anything from you right now for some strange reason. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone's saying alt s. Alt. Well, I'm on a I'm on a Mac. How does that would that be Apple S? Probably. Usually the they mess message I good. have is host disabled participant screen sharing. I check that. I've made. According to this, and I should be. Oh boy. 
here I am just saying I'm not a Luddite, but apparently I'm. We're all having tech issues and none of us are Luddites. So yeah. we're just going to put that out there. Let me check the, the Zoom settings. Um, Let me hit, let's see, how do I get out of? <laughs> I suddenly feel like my grandmother trying to figure out the VCR in 1985. Um, in other news, the link is working now. So if we, we have some downtime, you can all go click on that link while we're waiting. Okay, try to uh, stop sharing and then sharing again. I the problem is I don't know where that button is. Let me see. Let me see if I can find. Okay. If you hover up at the top of your screen, sometimes that's where the controls for mine are when oh, is it, oh there, there we go. go. You know, it's I success. must that's so strange. Yeah, I found it. I it takes found a village. It. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. All right. So we're back on. Uh, so is it? Um, do you see the slides? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me click through to where I'm at. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so the, the what I was saying was essentially that one of the things that I saw that students were really drawn to, and I'm sorry for taking so much time now, um, number of pages, uh, points, number of sources, these, these kind of numbers really leap out to students a lot, um, and they get um, they're, they're some of the things that I noticed when I was teaching this, uh, or encouraging them to, to uh, deconstruct um, assignment prompts and, and interpret them that they uh, th these are some things that stood out right away you know the due date is another important number you know and so I you know now with 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 that experience and with the experience of the meaningful inquiry workshop where um, one of the things that I got really interested in was thinking about the objective uh, with one of the things you learn about is uh, it's talk about in this workshop is you know why are you assigning <laughs> signing these papers and uh it's something that, that you're told you have to communicate to the students but it's also an important question to ask before you even assign the paper right is why why am i doing this and actually katie and i had a presentation to some teachers at osu newark based on uh, you know uh based on uh, the meaningful inquiry workshop about simon prompts and we had a really interesting discussion with somebody about that question of why am i even assigning a paper in this comparative studies class, a full length essay. And, and I'd love to talk about that later if anyone has any questions about that, because one of the things we kind of encouraged that person was to think maybe you don't assign a paper. Maybe it's a, it takes a different format, but, um, but what I wanted to do is investigate how students read prompts. And so I'm working on an IRB, I'm shaping a, a IRB proposal, uh, proposal for it. Um, right now there's a trial run uh, that I, I conducted just for this presentation with two of my peer writing consultants uh, on newer campus, uh, Heidi and Patrick. Um, those two popped up in opposite order. Um, and I think, uh, in, and I just wanted to share a couple of their uh, results right now, but my goal, I think, for the, uh, the my research that I want to do about this is um, have students do some read aloud protocols where they're looking at the assignment prompt and telling me what they're seeing and what they're um, what they believe they're being asked to do at that time. And then th there'll be follow up questions. But I think it'll be valuable for us as a teaching body to know how do students read assignment prompts, you know, and what do they look for? What are they, what do they not see? And what is confusing to them, you know? Um, so I just wanted to share a few things from this kind of trial run that I did for uh, today. And that in Heidi's uh, case, I will say uh, Heidi is has been primed kind of for this assignment. Her her personal bugaboo since she's worked for the writer studio for almost the last two years is uh, helping students try to deconstruct and, and interpret assignment prompts <laughs> uh, to the point where I think it's become her own personal uh, crusade that, you know, trying to trying to uh, ask for more clarification in assignment prompts. So to, we um, I gave them the prompt and I should put it in the chat. Um, uh, let me do that real quick in case anybody wants to look on. Derek, Ac Alex, actually, it was it's already in the chat, so you're good. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right, never mind. Um, and uh, the uh, so that prompt that that's in the chat is what the, if you wanted to look on uh, while I talk about it briefly here, um, feel free. But you can always 
look at it later. But one of the things that she uh, noted right away is that in, in this speaks to that numbers game that in the, the prompt that right next to one another, the teacher gives both a word count and a page range. And I think the, the, the teacher's point of view that was probably done to help clarify things and make things simpler. But Heidi right away took it. Well, should I be reaching for the pages and the, the, the words, you know, right away, that could be a point of confusion for student. Um, there, she also kept using the term uh, vague. There was a term in there where the teacher asked for credible websites. And of course, Heidi wasn't taking the class. So it's possible she allowed for that. It's possible that the teacher discussed what credible websites are in the class. But if not, that uh, saying something like credible website on its own doesn't necessarily uh, make it clear to the student what it is that you're asking for. And then also the, the, the verbs describe and evaluate. I think a lot of times we put too much faith in the verbs we use in our prompts um, that students will know exactly what they mean. And Heidi was very, uh, uh, had said there's a lot of room of what describe and evaluate might mean. Um, she complimented the specificity of the two requirements sections that the bottom sections of the prompt where they talk about specific dates, specific um, requirements. The, the, again, these all had, you know, the numbers game in it. And she said that th these were very, very easy to, to, for her to interpret as opposed to the actual prompt that's that's describing what the, uh, the part where it's describing what uh, the uh, instructor wants. And speaking of what the instructor wants, this is something that Heidi responded over and over again, as she said, it's hard for me to get an idea of what the teacher wants. And I think that's an important thing to remember too, is that the students are looking to shape the, whatever there is that they have to produce to what they think you you want. It's not like they're looking and we, as much as we'd love to think, here's something and, and have fun with it and, and, and go off on your own. But very often, their main goal is to appease the, the instructor. So um, so she kept on mentioning that. Um, as opposed to Heidi, one, the one thing I wanted to point out about Patrick's reading is Patrick um, took his took the text and put it into a text reader. Um, uh, Patrick um, uh, is using uses he writes a lot about um, his experience uh, as a student um, who's working with learning disabilities and he uses this assistant uh, this the assistant technology and what he was doing in there is he was uh, highlighting himself different um, words that he thought were interesting so this was an interesting way of a student reading the the um, prompt is that they were uh, going through and highlighting you know, we will see students do that on paper with actual highlighters as well. Um, but it, one thing I, I do want to notice is for the most part, the everything that's highlighted are nouns. And um, again, the verbs are kind of left in the background. And when we talk about tasks, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, in the tilt model, for those of you who have taken the meaningful inquiry, um, that the thing, one thing that's not leaping out to Patrick and what he did not highlight, for example, is the part where it says, um, describe and inf uh, describe and evaluate. Um, so it, it does suggest to me that um, there, there's more to be asked there about what, you know, what are we asking students to do and what, how do they interpret what it is that they're to do, it, you know, but the one, one thing that they're really, Patrick was really drawn to were the things rather than the what, the how to the what rather than the how to so um anyway so that's that's kind of just my brief foray into it i my hope is to have that um uh uh, uh survey ready to go and, and submit to irb sometime early in the autumn so i can uh, start to really uh, dive in i have a wonderful opportunity here on campus where we have students that are required to take tutoring so i'm able i would be able to you know set up a camera with them in their tutoring sessions reading these prompts out so i'm hoping to uh take advantage of that and that is essentially my uh my presentation for today thank you derek we we have plenty of time for questions or as Derek has on the, here, the screen here, uh, suggestions. So um, if folks do have questions or ideas, please feel free to unmute yourself and join that way or use the, the chat feature. Chris, yes, Chris Mannion, I see your hand is raised. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I know we talked about this, you know, both um, in, in the workshop, you know, years ago um, and, you know, in our, when we've worked with each other too, where are you in thinking about 
using this potentially as a kind of service for for faculty being able to you know have uh, faculty or instructors bring their um um you know assignments to the um you know the writer's studio and you know get some feedback along those lines because uh, you know as you know it's something that you know i've thought about now i think allison and i you know Kranick, who's the current you know um director of the writing center and i've you know kind of thrown the idea about but thinking about more about capacity and you know what the process is for doing that yeah uh well you know I, I think we've talked a little bit about before chris that um because on newer campus of course there is no you uh which you know which i think is a your 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 position is such a a, a valuable one for uh columbus and of course you've reached out to newark before but it but i've kind of said that i wanted to uh be a little mini manion so to speak um in the sense that i do want to kind of reach out and, and do some whack kind of concern for this campus in my position and i was explaining earlier that we're getting a couple of professional tutors um to help me uh in 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 our writer studio which will open me up for doing much more of this kind of going out into the uh to the group and i, I that is certainly something that i want to do is be able to promote more often that uh, that kind of uh, you know, hey, let's let's talk about your assignment prompts. I have had that experience with a couple of instructors on this campus already, but I'd like to kind of build up something a lot more um, that that isn't just a quick invitation, but sort of a, a sort of a, a, an understanding. You know, borrowing from I think a lot from the meaningful in inquiry workshop. You know that, uh, and but also from this study, I think it would be very helpful. My my hope is that the actual you know, doing this study will in and of itself be able to uh, to give me some things to kind of suggest to the faculty at large and, um, and you know, and certainly not just on newer campus. I'd, I'd certainly love to kind of uh, spread it. So I guess I, one of the things about me saying, do, uh, committing to this, I told Katie when she asked me to do this is like, now I have to do it because I'm, I'm telling a bunch of my colleagues that I want to do this study and and really I've, I've got no choice. I can't, I have to really shape this IRB proposal. So yeah, that is certainly um i think an end goal of this is to is to make it a good resource for across the curriculum to, for us to kind of uh, ask ourselves how do students how are they reading our prompts and to be uh, while i do want to start with just english i was thinking about even offering it as a this actual thing as a service if teachers want me to go into the classroom and say how are students reading your crop uh, prompts in history or biology or whatever that I that we certainly could do the same thing um if you know uh just you know it'd have to be you know IRB approved and everything but <laughs> thanks I you know I, I as as I've said especially you know in my time you know overseeing the, the writing center on the Columbus campus um for for a couple of years you know how valuable the right writing centers can be in being places where writing happens um and learning about you know how students are engaging in the process of writing um which you know faculty and instructors often just don't aren't able to see um and even if they do if they're you know do the good practice what happens in the writing center is just a you know really great new perspective that um you know, I as a WAC person coming, you know, focusing back on just WAC now, uh, we want to make sure that we we call attention to that work. Yeah, I absolutely. I mean, of course, I'm biased, but I one of one of my when I, you know, I just finished my PhD a few years ago, and in my a dissertation, one of my calls was for the writing center's uh, side of research more and more writing research more and more that and remember that we have this opportunity to really kind of see, you know, writing happen in situ. So, yeah. We do have time for another question if any folks have any and I see something. There's some things that came through on the, the chat here. Deb says, um, and I'll read because we're recording here in case folks aren't able to access the chat. For me, there seems to be a fine line slash tipping point between being vague and providing too much detail so that it overwhelms. And Jane responded, yes, Deb, trying to spell out everything quickly gets overwhelming. If folks are interested, we do have a sample activity that uh, instructors, sorry, scrolling, 
can do with students on interpreting a research assignment. And Jane's included a link to um, uh, one of the pages of the Teaching and Learning Resource Center uh, that was launched within the past year or so. Thank you. That is a problem, right? Because we do wanna give them as much detail as possible, but we also know when students are confronted or anybody is confronted with a wall of text, it can immediately be overwhelming and difficult to point out um, or uh, take away the key highlights of that assignment. So it is a balancing act and thinking about multiple forms of communication for expectations uh, for our assignments. Chris says, I've always benefited from getting student feedback in my own classes to figure out where that tipping point is. That's, that's a great point too. Chris, um, I might ask too, do the WAS, the writing associates, do they look at assignment prompts as part of, uh, as part of their work? Um, off, very often, yeah. Um, you know, um, I'm thinking, um, I'm looking at the people around who have had WAS. I know De Deb has. Um, I think you probably got some feedback. Um, and we certainly train them. We, in fact, we we train them uh, in the the tilt framework. We give them that framework. We trick, you know, give them, um, you know, the the bottleneck framework because I think. Um, you know, that often can be our key, because I think the challenge that Deb's getting at, although this isn't easy, this is an easy challenge by any means, um, is, you know, like finding where the bottlenecks are um, and thinking about how to prioritize information based on how students are interpreting um, the assignment. Um, so I think that's, you know, one, you know, value to the kinds of things that uh, Derek is talking about and the kinds of feedback that, you know, um, embedded consultants like WAS can give to sort of figure out how to prioritize that, because that's the hard thing is like figuring out what kinds of information to, to, to prioritize and you know, rather than just sort of trying to put in there our best guess of, you know, what's going to help students because that can get overwhelming. I, in fact, I was having a conversation to that effect uh, just earlier that day. And it's 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 not an easy question. But again, I think students can often offer some good feedback. And Deb says it's also challenging when you have first semester students and graduating seniors yep. in a course that's meant for sophomores. <laughs> Yeah, you're trying to cater to a whole range of um, college level experience there. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Derek, for sharing the work that you're doing. And we do hope that this session holds you accountable because I think we're all really interested in, in what you're going to learn. So, um, so as you embark on this research project, uh, please keep, up, keep us in mind for updates because this is really interesting work. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. I, I uh, intend to and, uh, and we'll probably, you know, borrow heavily from the workshop and help in shaping the proposal. So. And hopefully your work then can shape the workshop in the future, too. Excellent. Love it. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to share my screen here again for a moment if I can find the right window. And now it is, oh, that's why. I was looking for a slightly different pattern here. Our next presenter is Nick Denton, who again is from the College of Pharmacy. And one thing I'd like to highlight about Nick is he is one of the folks who received uh, a meaningful inquiry uh, grant in order to implement uh, some of the concepts that we covered in the workshop. He was part of our first cohort of recipients in spring of 2020, right before <laughs> everything changed in ways we never expected it to. Uh, so he, uh, Nick was working on that grant as we were all trying to figure out what teaching was going to look like uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, Nick, would you like to share your screen? Absolutely, Amanda. Great, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Yeah, I'm gonna kick you off your share, put in my share, and hopefully everyone can see that. Excellent, excellent. So as Amanda was saying, I'm from uh, College of Pharmacy and one of the courses that I teach is a second year writing course on drug use in American culture, hence the marijuana leaf that you're looking at. And uh, one of the courses that I teach is completely online, asynchronous. And during my first semester of teaching this course, 
I noticed that some of the final papers students were coming up with researching a topic of drug use in American culture uh, were making some very strong claims, some very maybe one-sided claims without addressing a lot of uh, glaring counter arguments to the student final papers. Uh, very rarely did I see students uh, mention any limitations or conditions or uh, any sort of rebuttals to their uh, theses. So it kind of got me thinking, what's going on here? I uh, had a few informal conversations with students, and there's even a misconception going about that, wait a minute, if I address like counter arguments or rebuttals, am I weakening my argument? And of course, I got to take a breath, say, okay, they're newbies, it's okay, it's okay, uh, and really explain that, hey, in academia, we make a point to address the limitations and conditions of our research or uh, these evidence-based policies, so that way we can make a more informed decision on uh, legalization, for instance. So in order to address this concern, I wanted to really emphasize argumentative writing in my students which they did have an assignment where we just kind of gave them a list of arguments to choose from, and they can write like a short paper about those, but it really wasn't getting the point across to students. So I had to think of a way, how do we engage students in argumentative writing? How do we emphasize that complex problems like legalization is gonna have certain conditions for, for different policies to work? It's gonna have uh, counter arguments that are both factual and correct, but we need to be able to emphasize why our policy or why our idea is the correct one in this given situation. So to emphasize this, I wanted to create a choose your own adventure or branch chain activity that simulates a debate on marijuana legalization to these students. So that is what you guys are seeing on the screen right now is the assignment page. And I'll also say meaningful inquiry is the entry point where I got into tilt, transparency in learning and teaching. So I like to include uh, some visuals. I make very clear what the purpose of this assignment is, why is persuasive argumentative writing important in various industries aside from academia. And as Jane pointed out, I'm also a huge fan of hyperlinks. So uh, you also see hyperlinks where if students are not really sure what exactly is uh, argumentative writing, they can get a little bit of a more uh, basic explanation of that by exploring the hyperlink there. I then task the students with going through this branch chain, choose your own adventure activity, and we'll get to play with it ourselves. So hang tight for that. And then write up a argument, a counter argument that they're going to run into in the branch chain, and then come up with a rebuttal to that counter argument supported with an outside resource. And I give them like a real simple, ex real simple example of what that might look like in terms of the weather, for instance, if we're talking about counter arguments and rebuttals. I got the rubric here so they know exactly what I'm looking for, what I'm bringing them on, what the points are. And now we can go ahead and start. And this is just the assignment page and that start button, it's fancy looking, but all it is is just a link to another Carmen page. This is all it is. It's just Carmen, uh, all in Carmen, just going in Carmen links to other pages that I make. So it's not any big fancy software. You can get fancy softwares if you want, but I just want to keep it all in Carmen. So that first question should be coming up in a poll to you guys right about, oh, if I can select the correct question, there we go. So again, this is anonymous, so don't worry about uh, saying what you think I want you to answer. What is your stance on recreational marijuana legalization? And I see we got four replies so far, five, six. Okay, getting some active learning here. All right, seven replies. I'll give everyone just five more seconds if they want to chime in. 
Oh, Deb, I wonder if it's because you're a co-host. Oh, is that one? I think co-hosts can't vote, yeah. I'm uh, sorry, co-hosts. Apologies. But if we go ahead and end that poll, I see that we are 63% wanting to go yes on marijuana legalization. So let's go ahead. Oh, I can share those results if you guys are interested in seeing for yourself, but I'll stop sharing for now. So let's see what happens when we click yes. Students will then go to this next page where it's like, okay, great. Do you support marijuana legalization? Which of these following reasons best matches your reason for supporting recreational marijuana legalization? And that's going to come up in our next poll for you guys to choose which path we take. So, there is, it's all natural. Natural products are much safer than synthetic drugs, or it has medical value. It treats dozens of conditions, or it's much safer than other recreational drugs, or it's gonna save the economy. Marijuana sales are in the billions of dollars. Oh, wow, a lot more diversity in this one. All right, we got six replies so far. Do we have eight again? Give you just five more seconds. End the poll, share results. All right, it looks like we are going with medical values. So, what do we think about recreational marijuana's medical value to the general population? So let's click that button. And now it brings us to the third chain where we now have an objection. Uh, scientists still don't know much about marijuana's biological effects on the body. So what is it about marijuana that makes it advantage, more advantageous over traditional medicines where we have a much better idea of what the mechanism of action is in our synthetic medication. Why should we use medical marijuana, which has all these active ingredients and are so much more difficult to regulate? And this objection is supported by an outside resource that I ask students to look into. And then I give them a few kind of reflection prompts to kind of remind them, okay, uh, do you pay attention to what you read? This is going to come up when you go back to the assignment page. And I put that link at the bottom here, which then brings them back to the original page, which has, again, that original prompt that tells that they have to take that, uh, that objection for, with an outside resource supporting it and then come up with a rebuttal to that objection and again, provide their own outside resource to support their rebuttal. And again, yep, this is back to the assignment page. So they have that submit button. They have the rubric again for them. And what we found here, if I can move the zoom bar a little bit. Oh how the zoom bar is in my way on the other side. There is just no win with this. There we go. There we are. So what we found when we implemented this branch chain activity is that, um, again, we implemented this right at the pandemic. So we weren't expecting a huge boost in the scores for their papers. But we did see a huge increase in the incidence of counter arguments and counter evidence included in those final research papers, where before it was like less than a third. And now we got the majority of students, including counter arguments and evidence in their papers and providing some more complex arguments in that final paper. We also see that while we didn't get a change, in the scores for the uh, short writing assignment that the branch chain replaced, we did see that in subsequent 
argumentative writing assessments. So the uh, discussion board that they may take like about three or four weeks after that initial branch chain activity, we start to see improvement in student performance scores on subsequent argumentative writing assessments. So there may be a little bit of a um, there may be a little bit of a repeat learning factor there or a little bit of a, a processing time that's used to really let that lesson sink in before we start to see it in student performance. And then in our exit survey for the course, we ask students questions about what are they going to remember about this course five years from now? And where before we had hardly anyone mentioning uh, these two factors, which then uh, increase substantially post implementation of the branch chain is that we have a huge increase in students leaving the course with an impression of the complexity of drug regulation. We had more students leaving the course with an impression of the importance of information literacy as well. So these were some of the main takeaways that we took from the branch chain activity. And now we're starting to wonder, okay, what are some other uses for branch chain activity and meaningful inquiry? Can we use it to identify whether um, other underserved students are learning better from these branch chain activities? If it's um, an equitable learning tool, are there other areas besides writing that can benefit from branch chain activities? Can we simulate patient interviews, for instance? Can we simulate research studies where different steps in an experiment may result in different uh, data being presented to students. So there's a lot of potential with this and it really all started with some of those initial concepts we got from the uh, uh, meaningful inquiry, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the meaningful inquiry workshop, which was then supported with the meaningful inquiry grant. So, uh, I think I have just a few minutes. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Nick. Again, folks, feel free to unmute or raise your hand if that's more comfortable or use the chat. Nick, I'll ask one question. Um, that I, I'm fairly sure I know the answer of, but uh, others may be curious too. You participated in the workshop and the grant, but you implemented this with a team of colleagues in, in the College of Pharmacy, is that correct? Correct, right, right, right. So we got the idea uh, kind of ironed out during the workshop, but I am one of almost a dozen instructors that teach this particular course. So when I showed the branch chain activity to the other instructors, they were really excited about it. They wanted to put it into their own courses. So we did that and we increased the amount of students that were participating in the study substantially. I'm still getting data from uh, colleagues that are just now submitting that to me. And now we're going to finalize that paper, hopefully this fall. Wonderful. If you do, please share that with us so we can add the citation to our suggested readings list for participants. Excellent. And I see we have a few comments yes. here. Ellen, that is a really interesting way to lead the students to address the counter arguments in a non-threatening way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another fine point is that uh, uh, in a traditional debate, uh, there were some issues with students uh, maybe kind of sandbagging with the rest of the team and letting the and letting one or two people do most of the talking. Uh, we really wanted students to have their voice heard in a safe place. So even if that's just doing the simulation and submitting it so that I'm the only one reading it, um, I, I, I think that we were able to engage more students that way that were maybe facing identity threat than we would if we were trying to make this a team project or uh, something that was much more public to the rest of the class. All right, Derek, is the transfer repeat of learning you mentioned across classes in classes further down the, oh, in courses further down the line? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, we did see this same transfer of learning when we looked 
within classes taught through various modalities. So I taught the online asynchronous, but we also had online synchronous and in-person classes that implemented it. And they saw the same trend. Uh, we didn't try looking into classes after ours though. So I'm not sure uh, how we would go about organizing that. That would probably be something more at the programmatic level, or maybe if now that we have these e-portfolios, we can maybe dive a bit deeper into what kind of work the students are doing after they take our class. So yeah, that's a good question. We haven't looked into that. And Jane, this really emphasizes the idea that there are an ongoing scholarly conversation and not just one right answer. Yeah, you got me there, Jane. Uh, I definitely listen in on a lot of your talks about scholarly conversation, and that was for sure another inspiration to it. Uh, so yeah, being able to, again, show that there isn't just one right answer, but we can still argue that under certain conditions, maybe one direction is gonna work out better. But yeah, it's a, it's a complex problem with no true correct answer to it. Uh, let's see, what is the role of Pharmacy 267 in the new GE? Um, will be the embedded literacy for the college. Uh, we are actually going with the health and well-being route for this course. Uh, so still very much going to have that kind of uh, information literacy component to it. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we feel like uh, we have a unique niche where we can talk more about the health, health and well-being side of things. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you so much, Nick, for sharing your work with us. I'll put another uh, plug in for Nick. Uh, I just learned about some other work that he's doing that I think is probably also of interest to meaningful inquiry folks around social annotation and teaching students how to read primary literature or scientific literature, um, especially early career undergraduates. So uh, maybe at some point in the future, Nick received a Sasser grant for that student academic success research grant which is offered through our Office of Student Academic Success, or OSAS. So maybe at some point in the future too, Nick, we'd, we'd like to hear more about the work that you're doing there. So if this could be a captive audience for you to, to share some milestones, please let us know. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, love to talk to anyone who might be interested in uh, some social annotation work as well, branching activities. Um, I, I have my email on that last slide, but I'm sure you all have it. If you want to follow up, answer any questions, I'm always free to nerd out about this stuff. And I agree with Chris. Uh, Nick does do all the cool stuff. That does seem to be a very accurate statement. Our third and final presenter is Deborah Kazawa, who comes to us from engineering education. Uh, Deb, would you like to share your screen? Yes, please. The floor should be yours. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Let's try this again. Thanks for making me feel better, Deb. Well, no, I'm just having, uh, you when I hit the share, I couldn't see anything. So you might've been able to see it, but I couldn't see anything, so. That is weird. We're just yeah. having all the technical difficulties today. It's just, just the hour of the day. We know we're heading towards the end of August. <laughs> Yeah, right Deb, now we can see your screen. Window. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now it's full screen. Yep. Can you all see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I'm uh, Dr. Deb Kuzawa from Engineering Education. 
where I've been teaching engineering technical communication since 2014, both to undergrads and graduate students. But today I'm gonna to be focused on engineering 2367. So another gen ed course um, that meets second level writing and social diversity in the United States. So uh, I'm gonna be honest, this event is about the meaningful inquiry process and endorsement, but my um, journey with meaningful inquiry started quite a bit earlier than when I actually took the um, endorsement. Um, about four years before, actually, I would say, probably earlier than that, but uh, in 2016 is when I took the course development institute, and I think that really kicked everything off for me. So um, this quotation from Mitch Kapoor is something that I use in my classes, and to me, it encapsulates what I see as my greatest challenge as an educator, and specifically as somebody who's teaching writing, communication and research. Um, how do we help students engage and be responsible citizens in our globalized, polarized world where we have a million streams of information coming at us constantly? Um, so Engineering 2367 is technical communications, the official theme, American attitudes towards technology. There's four units in the course, a job unit, which is all focused on the process of applying for jobs, interviewing, networking, all of that. Recommendation unit focused on organizational climate and culture, um, a public communication unit. And then the final unit is called synthesizing research and it's a problem solving um, uh, research-based funding proposal. It's uh, actually based on the uh, Betha grant, if you're familiar with that. So it's uh, the requirements, a lot of it is very similar to the Betha grant, only um, obviously not exactly the same because we're talking about uh, undergrads. So in each one of these sections or each one of these units, students have a wide range of control over the topic and focus and uh, self-reflection is a is a component for each unit. And that's been pretty constant, constant since about 2015 in terms of that format, but it's still gen ed uh, for writing and social diversity. So it's not a course that students are really excited about or are opting into because they're really excited about the content. They're enrolling in it because it creates two uh, GEs, right? It's another check checkbox. So, um, so my goal for where students should be at the end of the semester and where they were wasn't always matching. Um, so that's why I decided in May of 2016 to complete the Course Development Institute. And that really helped me reimagine my course. Um, and so then between the fall of 2016 and summer of 2020, I completed several endorsements, including inclusive teaching, teaching through writing, teaching information literacy, instructional redesign, and then meaningful inquiry. Um, and to be honest, a lot of these, I was trying to get credit for the work I'd already been doing with my background in rhetoric, composition, and literacy studies. Um, obviously, teaching through writing is, <laughs> is what my PhD is based on. So, um, but these were all, even if it was information that I was familiar with, every single one of these provided me with a greater depth, a new perspective or something like that. So um, starting by fall of 2016, I started augmenting my lessons on rhetorical analysis, which is the backbone of my courses with selections from university libraries, ebook, choosing and using academic resources, in particular chapter six, which is thinking critically about sources. And that includes uh, crap, uh, which you might be familiar with, C-R-A-A-P, which is uh, a way of analyzing sources. So it's currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So I started using that. And then I also started using um, this short article, a three-step guide to identifying dis and misinformation. So this is fall of 2016. Um, Solutions Institute, I don't even know if it's still around. And I'll be honest, I didn't use it beyond this semester. Okay, so I did use it for this semester. And the reason why um, is because uh, it functioned less as a checklist. And that's one of the big critiques of the CRAP um, process is that it functions more like a checklist rather than a critical process. So the components of this three-step guide are test primary source info, including keeping in mind that the website is the source, uh, the website is not the source, but the writer is the source. Um, identifying the bias of the article, identifying the author bias, and then they have a bonus, apply Occam's razor. The simplest answer is often the most accurate. So combined with the chap chapter six, I saw students moving more towards my learning goals of being more critical readers, users, and creators of information. So, but while those were both useful, um, it, I still wasn't getting what I wanted. And so that's when I started focusing more narrowly on information literacy and making information literacy a cornerstone of the course. And so I, I started using the framework for information literacy for higher education from ARCL. Um, so students would read the document, they would come to class, they would be split up into groups, and each group would have a different frame. So 
um, authorities constructed and contextual, they would have to put it into their own words and provide an example in the wild. So what, what does this look like in day-to-day -day life? And that was okay. Um, if you've ever read the um, ARCL document, the language is difficult to, struggle, to, to wrestle with, right? So it wasn't really getting what I wanted because students were really struggling with the language and it was this one, one day thing and it just didn't quite work. So I still wasn't quite getting what I wanted. So that's where all the workshops started coming in from UITL and now the Drake Institute and university libraries. So by August of 2017, um, so this is um, a couple years, this is actually several years before completing the, the, the MI endorsement. I started classes by introducing Bloom's taxonomy, um, both the original and the digital. And I'd use a poll to ask, I'd ask students to reflect on their own experiences in education and where their experiences have mostly fallen. And I used a poll and then we would discuss that. Um, I made, I always make sure to emphasize that this is not a hierarchy. All of the different elements of Bloom's taxonomy are required um, and that we're going to be using all of them throughout the semester. And then I try to, although it's, I think I'm a little inconsistent, um, to pull those out, pull those different levels out when uh, talking about different assignments. Um, I also uh, started making this, uh, choosing and using sources or resources as a primary textbook and so used most of the chapters throughout the semester. Uh, I continue to use the frameworks for information literacy, only um, I spread them out throughout the semester. So instead of reading all six at once, it would be, okay, so this week we're going to read this one and then we're going to discuss it. And so the whole class would be focused on a single one rather than trying to cover all of them in a single class. Um, most importantly, um, I started breaking things down even further. So some more smaller low stakes activities and excitements. Um, so for example, an analyzing a web source for reliability and utility for a specific task or for a specific audience. Um, reading journals, I started using reading journals. So these are student identified resources um, uh, according to a particular theme, usually tied to the uh, whatever unit we're in. So the job unit, uh, recommendation unit. And these um, are mimic the process for an annotated bibliography. So students identify a source, they provide citation information, they do a brief summary, um, a brief analysis, um, and uh, it's a very low stakes assignment in that if students follow the instructions, they get full credit. Um, and this is the whole idea here is to get them comfortable finding and analyzing relevant resources. One of my favorites was uh, one semester, um, soon after I started using these, um, we got to the annotated bibliographies and uh, there was a team and there was two students talking to one another and the one was asking questions like he was confused about the annotated bibliography. He's like, no, 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 man. It's just like those reading journals we've been doing all semester. I was like, yeah, it is. It's like I planned it. And they just started laughing. They're like, yeah, I see how it connects. And I was like, yes, that's great, right? So I've been trying to get more um, out of those. So for about four semesters, I continued along those lines. So um, I revise my assignment prompts often, at least once per year, but usually twice. And these might be minor edits and they might be major. Um, as I mentioned, student reflections and self-assessments are part of each unit. And there's also a midterm and end of semester self-assessment that is focused on participation and engagement. And those really help me identify the bottlenecks that I might not be aware of or that are new to this new crop of students. Because as we all know, from semester to semester or section to section, those bottlenecks are not the same. Um, this is also helpful for their students being able to identify what did they do? Why did they do it? How did they do it well? Where did they stumble? Where did they drop the ball? How hard did they work? Where did I drop the ball, right? Um, and helps me see where there's still gaps. One change that has made a difference um, starting in spring 2020, uh, as I turned, and this was, uh, again, one of those things with uh, spring 2020, pandemic, right? The start of COVID. Um, I turned the annotated bibliographies for the final research unit um, into relatively low stakes assignments. That is, again, if they followed the instructions, most teams are going to get an A, A minus, they're going to get a high grade, and they're labeled works in progress. As a way to emphasize to students, research is never done, right? Um, it's done for now. So that's something that is then they turn it in, they get feedback, and then they update it. So for the final assignment, they have a, a much larger annotated bibliography. And overall, this process has really produced stronger sources and projects in general. Um, so uh, teaching at the information literacy workshop, also I use a lot of tools from that. Um, so there's, I, I no longer use the actual language from 
um, framework for information literacy um, exactly. I'm using the tables from the information literacy workshop. Um, there's ta there's tables that talk about the practices and dispositions for each frame. Um, and then there's short videos. And so I started using those. Um, and then I've sprinkled them throughout the semester. Um, and uh, I just last year started including info literacy frame questions with the reading journal assignment. So with this source, how do these different frames apply? And that was really uneven and that was all on me. It's because I wanted to do it, but I didn't spend enough time with it. And so I didn't edit the questions in a way to make it um, more meaningful for students. And so I feel good about how that's changed for the fall. But for this upcoming fall, the big change I've made is really just being more explicit. And that's what I've taken away mostly from, the, from this process is you have to be explicit. And so one of those things is I actually have a column that is for in class, and I previously had this, but um, so I have before class, in class, by the end of the day, so what's due. And the middle section of uh, the class of what's being done in class is more for me, but it also provides more transparency to students. So for example, summary, uh, summarizing assignments is something that I do in class, um, but sometimes, uh, I don't think I do a good job, right? Because I'm summarizing my own assignment. And so um, I've now put it in there. So I'm going to have students in their in their um, in class groups, each each one. Okay, what what is a, a short summary of what this assignment is asking you to do? Um, some of the activities from the info literacy um, um, workshop, for example, as well. I am so way over time. So I'm gonna speed on through. So last school year, I actually uh, began reducing the amount of readings from choosing and using sources, and instead have started using um, Check Please, a student guide to web fact checking. This is a three hour course, five steps to fact checking and being a critical reader. Um, so uh, Caulfield uses SIFT, stop, investigate, further investigate, find trusted coverage and trace claims and content. So I shifted from using choosing using sources as much because this um, is more focused, a little bit more relatable, and importantly, it's it's interactive and multimedia in a way that choosing is not. Um, it provides really strong examples. However, it's not about academic research. So I'm still using choosing and using sources, but I'm relying on, on it less. So what's meaningful, right? Uh, student control over the process and focus. I teach a gen ed like none of them really want to be there, right? And so by giving students um, control over, um, you know, the focus of their projects, um, I, I'm getting more engagement. Um, for me, this idea of relevancy, it's about, can, is this applicable beyond my class? And so with the information literacy, I found that that has been really helpful. So for this last one, um, this might be tricky, but to me, if your course isn't meaningful to you, it's less likely to be meaningful to your students. So personally, for me, focusing on information literacy and meaningful inquiry is how I have dealt with the increasing deluge of mis and disinformation. And to be completely honest, the march of totalitarianism around the globe. Um, so this is not about politics per se, though students can and do interpret any discussions and data about social diversity in the United States, one of the main focus of the course, as inherently political. Um, but this is really to me about being an informed and responsible citizen. So I, I have found that focusing on information literacy has been very useful to me um, in teaching topics that some find inherently political, such as inclusion, diversity, and equity. Um, and so talking with my colleagues who don't have such an information literacy focus, they get pushed back in ways that I really don't. And so um, that's one thing that's been helpful for me. Um, so I'm going to end here. So my goal as an instructor of writing, communication, and research is to produce critical thinkers who can find, use, and create information in ethical and meaningful ways. Um, and it's a continual process. So I am so over time, and I'm really sorry about that. You're good, Deb. <laughs> it is no problem at all. I really appreciated that you shared the evolution of your course. I think you mentioned how one of the things that you do with the annotated bibliography is that it's like in progress, right? Because the idea that research is never done, but also I think you've demonstrate that, demonstrated that in terms of teaching practice today too, that um, uh, you're do, you have been doing great things in your class for many, many years, but uh, you're continuing to think about uh, what's working, what could be tweaked, what new resources you know about, what is happening currently in terms of what students are facing and how you're incorporating that into your class. Thank you.
folks, we do have a couple of minutes here for, for some questions if, if, or, uh, or comments. Again, you can raise your hand, you can just unmute yourself, or you can use the chat. Also, Jane has put the link to the Check Please starter course in the chat. Yes, thank you. And Jane's put a lot of links uh, throughout. Uh, and so much appreciated, Jane, for um, making sure folks are able to access those materials. Um, and if anybody is interested in Check Please, I do have um, accessible captioned videos because uh, Mike Caulfield, there's a lot of videos. And so um, I, I had a student who needed um, them to be properly captioned. So I do have them through Mediasite. I have links to those videos as well, um, if anybody is interested in them. Deb, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, so since you, you've been doing this work for a long time and made, you know, continually making changes to your course, um, you know, for those folks that are kind of just starting out on this process, um, is there one thing that you would really recommend that you have done that you think has made the greatest impact or, you know, a place where someone could really get started uh, kind of making these kinds of changes? Well, I mean, I feel that the course development institutes are really um, essential, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, because I find that when you take the course development institute, I can feel a little overwhelming, but it can also feel like, oh yeah, obviously, right? Uh, obviously, that's how you should do this, right? So I would say, I would say, start there, right? I would probably start there. Um, I found the te teaching inf information literacy. Um, by the time I took that workshop, I had been incorporating the ARCL stuff for a while, but that was super helpful for me as well. Um, I thought that was um, really great. And uh, anybody who teaches a writing course. Um, or a course that has any degree of writing, the teaching through writing is really essential, for sure. <laughs> yeah, not now uh, Chris says he needs to give me $20. Um, yeah, so I think that for, for me, last year is the first year where I actually taught something other than 2367. Um, I taught the, our grad course, which is a whole different world, right? Teaching a, a engineering grad students, uh, technical communications is, a, is, a, is completely different. Um, so one of the reasons why I continue to do these types of things is because I'm teaching the same three sections of the same class every single semester since 2014. And it's a way to keep me interested in what I'm doing, um, as well as uh, keep the students interested in what I'm doing. Um, I'm interested to see how things go once the GEs change. Um, basically, this class, 2367, is, is two classes in one. And so we're basically splitting it up into a 1300 level course, which is going to be like, um, which ha none of them have been approved. And we also have not gotten any feedback on why. So we don't know really what's going on. But one is going to be an information literacy and introduction to scientific writing. And the other one is going to be one of the thematic courses uh, about uh, diversity, citizenship, and a just world, or whatever, I can't remember what it's called. Um, so the content of this is going to be split up into, into basically two classes. And that's the biggest challenge with this course is it's trying to do so many things. Thank you again, Deb, for sharing the work that you've been doing with us. If folks are new to Mike Caulfield, who authored the book that, or the, uh, who, developed the SIFT method that Deb was talking about, he kind of has a long history in terms of being a pioneer and thinking about web fact checking and particularly how to get students to become uh, web fact checkers. And some of his early work is called digital polarization or digipo. So if, if we've piqued your interest and that's new to you, do you can do a Google search for Mike Caulfield and SIFT or digital polarization, and you should be able to find some inter interesting materials there. We have um, just a couple of more items on the agenda here. Uh, I really wanted to take a, a couple of minutes here to uh, highlight some opportunities available through the Drake Institute for folks who complete the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop. And I know we have a combination of Meaningful Inquiry alumni as well as some folks who have not yet participated in Meaningful Inquiry. So I hope this could be of interest um, 
to everyone. We have a little bit of a pathway through opportunities here, and I presented that as somewhat of a timeline, starting with the teaching endorsement, the instructional redesign program, and then research and implementation grants. And that research and implementation grant on the far right, the bottom text should say level two up to 7,500. So I made a, I think what I did was copied and pasted and then I forgot to actually uh, update the text. Um, so the first thing that we have here is the meaningful inquiry endorsement. And if you're not familiar, this is available to all of the participants, all of them, um, excuse me, all of the participants who have completed the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop, whether it's virtually or in person. An endorsement is a credential provided by the Drake Institute to identify and recognize faculty, staff, and students who pursue excellent, excellence in teaching by participating in professional learning programs at the Ohio, Ohio State University. I apologize, some of you know, I'm getting over a migraine and while I feel great right now, uh, it does affect my speech for um, a couple of hours after. So if I'm stumbling over words, I apologize. Um, you are not required to apply for an endorsement in order to participate in the workshop, but this is a, another way that you can be recognized for the professional learning that you have done by participating in an intensive workshop experience. And I learned from our colleague, Dave Sovic this morning, um, uh, these are conscriptable. There are ways uh, that you can share this recognition uh, with others. So for example, I know if graduate students participate, this can be added to their transcript, but also uh, you can get a letter from the Drake Institute's director that could be sent to your supervisor, your chair, or your dean to indicate that you have been awarded uh, one of these credentials. So if you would participate in the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop, there is an endorsement application form and the Drake Institute does have a rubric available on their website, which is included on the slide here. And you can view the reflection questions that you'll be asked to answer um, uh, through that rubric, as well as how they evaluate the answers to those questions. Um, they review the, the applications for this a couple of times a year. Uh, so we do have an upcoming deadline of August 12th, but uh, if, if you are interested in applying for an endorsement, you don't have to get it in uh, by that August 12th deadline. You could submit sometime during the fall semester and they will begin reviewing those applications on December 19th. And I should say, if you are a previous participant, but you participated a couple of years ago, your participation doesn't expire. So please do feel free to submit an application for the endorsement if that's of interest to you. And for my colleagues uh, on the line, I can see that there's been some chats. So if folks have any questions that come up in there, please uh, just interrupt me with, with uh, the mics. The next opportunity is instructional redesign. And some of you may be familiar with this program as well. This would be available to meaningful inquiry participants who completed the Teaching at Ohio State Carmen course and who have um, an appointment that is at least a uh, 0.75 FTE. And for this, uh, you receive a one-time payment of $1,150 every five years. They have done a significant revision to the instructional redesign program that recent, was just recently launched. So if you were familiar with this program in the past um, and didn't participate for whatever reason, uh, it's worth maybe looking into again now because it's possible that it looks a lot different than it did the last time you looked at it. So there are three tracks available for instructional redesign, a retrospective review. So for example, the work that we heard about today from our colleagues, it's been implemented in the past, but it's work that they completed. Uh, there is a template available uh, where they could work through that to then submit an instructional redesign application to receive both credit and compensation for that work. There's planning new instruction. So we just wrapped up uh, a cohort of meaningful inquiry participants this morning. Some of them may be thinking about how to implement meaningful inquiry into their own teaching practices and maybe thinking about some revisions to their courses or assignments. If they are, they could use the planning new instruction template uh, to think about how to approach uh, that work and then again, also receive some recognition and compensation for doing that revision work. 
And then there is also the instructional redesign portfolio track, which is essentially the, the previous program, the program that had existed before. So if you were familiar with that program, it was appealing to you, but you weren't necessarily able to participate in it previously, um, you still have the opportunity to participate in uh, the original version of the program. And I just learned today that the um, deadlines are on the website, which was just updated uh, very recently. Uh, they will be reviewing instructional redesign applications quarterly. So the next uh, due date for that would be uh, October 1st. And then the one after that would be January 1st. And our colleague Dave Sovic mentioned there's about a one month turnaround time there. So if you were to submit an application for the October 1 deadline, you should expect to hear by about November 1st, the status of your, your application. And then last but not least, we have the research and implementation grants, uh, focusing specifically at the moment on the level one grant. The eligibility is the same uh, for this program as it was for instructional redesign. Uh, you must uh, have completed the teaching at Ohio State Carmen course and have a 0.75 uh, appointment as an instructor. Uh, one thing that we're doing for uh, the future of the Meaningful Inquiry Grant Program, the program that uh, Nick had completed a couple of years ago, we're now partnering with the Drake Institute to continue that program. So there will be up to three spots every year for Meaningful Inquiry participants to submit and potentially receive a research and implementation grant at the level one level. And one of the appealing things about partnering with the Drake Institute on this is that uh, colleagues will, who, who decide to do this will receive additional support. So previously, um, colleagues who participated in the Meaningful Inquiry Grant would receive support from the Meaningful Inquiry Facilitation Team. Um, you'll still have the support of the facilitation team, but you'll also have the support of the Drake Institute. Um, these are also up to $2,500 uh, for an implementation or research project lasting for about a, a year. And Dave thought that proposals are likely to be due again in late February or early March of 2023. So there's plenty of time if this is appealing to you, but you're preparing for the beginning of the new school year and it's just a little too much to think about right now, uh, there's plenty of time to think about what a project could look like if you think that this would be helpful to you. And of course, with any of these, um, you do have access to the Meaningful Inquiry Facilitation Team. We can provide consults as you're working through an instructional redesign project, or if you're thinking about um, submitting a research and implementation grant. I also know that our Drake Institute colleagues are also happy to provide consults for those as well. So again, if we go back to our timeline here, um, I think there's a nice setup for meaningful inquiry participants to move through some of these opportunities for recognition and compensation. So with the teaching endorsement, you have the opportunity to reflect on what it is you learned in the Meaningful Inquiry Workshop. You can then build on that by thinking about putting together an instructional redesign portfolio for submission. Maybe as you were reflecting on what you've learned, you thought about a couple of different revisions that you could make in your courses that might be meaningful or significant. The instructional redesign program is a really great way to do that. And then if you really wanted to be able to assess those outcomes, much like uh, some of the work that Nick and his colleagues have been doing and he shared with us, uh, the research and implementation grant would be a great way to think about actually assessing uh, the changes that you, you've made and what that means for student outcomes or student learning in your course. Again, with the support of both Meaningful Inquiry folks as well as the Drake Institute. Do folks have any questions? And I um, put a question in the chat. I was just curious myself, if someone has already received the Meaningful Inquiry Grant, can they still then receive a research and implementation grant? Sure, that's a great question, yes. There's nothing that I foresee that would prevent them from doing so. And just like uh, our previous Meaningful Inquiry Grant winners, um, they were also uh, eligible to use the work that they've been doing with their Meaningful Inquiry Grant 
to apply for instructional redesign and get that additional $1,150 in compensation. If you do have questions about any of the opportunities through the Drake Institute, please feel free to reach out to me uh, with those questions. I might not know the answers immediately, but I can certainly uh, get in touch with my Drake Institute colleagues to make sure that we get the answers uh, to them. And if you have questions about meaningful inquiry more generally, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Again, presentation materials, including these slides, will be available at this link. I think we've troubleshooted it enough now that it is actually working. I'm not sure what happened, uh, but I think it's up and running now. And I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Derek, Nick, and Deb for sharing their experiences uh, with us today. We're very excited to have you as our inaugural cohort of showcase uh, uh, presenters. We hope that those of you who are joining us uh, will be interested in sharing the work that you're doing at a showcase in the future. Um, thank you for everyone for your continued interest in meaningful inquiry and also to the Drake Institute who is always willing to partner with us uh, to help meaningful inquiry participants make changes in their course, but also receive some recognition and compensation for doing that work. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I hope everybody has a great afternoon. It's looking like it, the sky's getting a little bit dark over here on the Columbus campus. So if it does storm this afternoon, I hope everybody stays dry. Uh, take care, everyone.